Hey guys, what is going on this morning? Brent Abel here at webtennis.com. Another episode of Seven Around Seven. Where are we? 7.15 this morning. Got a Wednesday morning out here in the California desert, Southern California, Rancho Mirage, specifically the uh, Mission Hills Country Club. Looking forward to a little romp on the clay this morning. Uh, here we've got four clay courts, which we've just spent some money on and some time and and kind of dug them up a little bit and and hopefully they're going to be playing a lot better than they were before um just this desert weather man really bakes those things and if you're not you know if you're not doing the european maintenance where you're on those several times a day they just get thrashed so we shall see anyway looking forward to that i uh, hope you guys are doing well a beautiful morning here and uh what have i got for you today yeah the three keys to stop making unforced errors and um, yeah, look, so what have we been talking about recently? You know, we were talking about yesterday about skill level range, reducing your skill level range and trying to think about, well, what's the very top? Well, the very top is you can hit if you're a, you know, let's say you're a 4-0. Well, you can hit four or five shots, right? But you just can't do it consistently enough to be a true 4-5. And the same, on the other, or I should say, in on, on the other side of the coin, we can all chunk, right? If we're a 4-0, we can all chunk some balls and miss some easy balls. And now we're now we're kind of playing at that, you know, 3-6, 3-7 level. And that's why that's why we stay at 4-0. So look, um, really the key here is getting consistent, right? It's being a consistent shot maker. And I want to tell you a story before I get into the three keys. I got a little story I want to tell you that if you've been with me for any amount of time, um, you've, you've heard the story. It's very short, but when I heard it, it, um, it made a huge difference for me. Um, so I was playing the, I was playing the indoors, uh, the 60 indoors in Seattle one year. And, uh, you know, this wasn't that long ago, right? Probably 10, 11, 12 years ago. And one day I'm having lunch with, um, multi gold baller, multi as in lots in, you know, <laughs> Uh, Jody Rush. And uh, so Jody and I were sitting down, we we're having lunch and we were just chatting. And all of a sudden we come, come uh, upon this thing where uh, Jody said, uh, you know, my dad once told me as a kid growing up as, as a junior, he said, son, if you never miss the easy, right, the easy ball, um, you'll become a national champion. And the easy ball, meaning that if you get that fat sitter, like you've just hit a nice, a nice groundy, and uh, you get sort of a response from that that opponent where the where, where the ball's just sitting up around the tee. Let's just call it the tee where it's sitting, right? It's not a low flying skitter. It's just sitting up there begging you to just unload. And and most of the time, what we do is it's kind of based on the our perception of the quality of the opponent over there. Is if we're playing someone who's maybe below our skill level, all right? We don't. I mean, sometimes we might go in there and go, well, I'm going to really rub it in your face and boom, we hit the back fence or boom, we hit the bottom of the net. Uh, or we're playing someone that's really good, right? And we think, well, look, if, you know, if this guy anticipates, you know, which which corner I'm going to, I better really unload. And the next thing you know is that fat sitter just gets just gets butchered, right? It's either hit deep or it's hit short. So something like, I mean, in the net. And it's an unforced error. So, um, what his dad meant, what Jody's dad meant was you don't have to hit a winner off of the sitter to become a national champion. All you have to do is just never miss it. And never missing it means that it's a two shot mindset, right? I've, I've got the sitter. I see it coming in. And as I approach it, as I come up to it, I'm thinking right now I've got a target. The target could be one of the, one of the two corners. Heck it could be right up the middle assuming that 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 opponent's going to guess one corner or the other and right before you make contact it's going to start moving over there we see it in tv all the time we see the pros do this they go right smack dab back up the middle and it's rare when when an opponent just sits there and you know and gives you both corners so and 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 so that's that's the first part of it right the second part is you got to assume it's going to come back. You've got to assume that what whatever shot choice you've made, one of those three, 
and, and heck, maybe you're, even you're coming in and, and thinking of a fourth shot choice would be the complete false advertising. I'm loading up to go to that corner and then whoop, you play the little dropper, right? Okay, but whatever shot you play, you've got to assume that they're going to guess, they're going to anticipate, and they're going to get they're going to get to it, and and so you've you've got to you know execute your shot in a way that also allows you to be in the next best court position. That could be right where you are when you make the shot, or it could be that if I'm going for this corner after the shot, I need to be a few feet over to the right or a few feet over to the left, whatever or maybe a couple of feet closer inside the service line. But it's got to be a, a two-shot mindset. So when he told me that, when Jody told me that story, it just made so much sense that, that you know, the reality is we miss a lot of easy, easy opportunities. And that is so crazy, frustrating. And so what I want to give you today are kind of the three things that I think that um, – that I kind of came away from with, with that lunch with Jody and that story that he told me. And, uh, you know, number one is you've got to understand you've that, that the spacing, right? The spatial distance between you and the path of that ball between you and the eventual contact point is crucial for you to be able to consistently, we're talking about consistency here for you to be able to consistently execute simplified stroke technique, right? Once the space and once you crowd it or once the ball's too far away, now you got to improvise. And, and, you know, that's not part of the lesson. You know, when you're out on the court working with your, with your pro, you're not working on, imp, you know, improv. You're, you're, you're working on how do you become number one? How do you identify for you? And, 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 you know, if you look at the picture here, obviously I'm teeing up to hit a forehand here. So what I'm working on in this picture is what's my ideal, unique spatial distance away from the ball that I need at contact, right? Yours could be slightly different and, in, and, and it could be slightly different than the next guy, right? doesn't matter. The key is, is that you have to know what your ideal spacing is and you can, you know, you can try to model other other players or other pros or other whatever that's fine but in the end those players all have slightly different you know body builds body shapes body whatever than you do and you still have to figure out what is your unique spatial distance that you got to have away from the path of the ball so that you can execute the shot uh, that you want the second thing is that you've got to start to identify is what is your honeypot on this forehand, for example? Where do you want to receive the ball? Where's the ideal point of contact for you? That's different. I mean, spacing is the first thing that you line up, right? But the second thing is you got to know that when you make contact with the ball, is it going to be, is it going to be, you know, slightly in front of you? Is it going to be slightly? I mean, you look at Boris Becker or Steffi's forehands. Those things look like they were super late, but man, they weren't for them, right? You look at some of the air players and they're, they're further in front, right? Further out towards the net than say Becker or Graf were. And so, but you have to figure out based on, on your grip, based on your swing shape, based on a lot of different things, what's your ideal point of contact. And then you've got to allow the ball to get there, right? So once you identify, well, here's where I, here's where it feels right. Um, at contact, then the next thing is on the incoming ball, assuming that you've got the spatial distance created the way that, that that's right for you, do you have the guts to receive the ball, allow the ball to get into that honeypot, into your unique honeypot? And and if you don't, if you rush it, if you get too far in front, and my my belief, I don't have the data to prove it, but just my, my opinion is the timing mistake that most players make is they're too early. Is there is they want to get rid of the ball too soon. They may be seeing an opening over there, whether it's up the line or cross court, and they want to get it there before the ball actually gets into their ideal point of contact, right? Unforced error. So number one is going to be spacing. Number two is going to be identifying what's your unique point of contact on for if you're working on your forehand, could be something else. 
Uh, the third thing is, just like I've got in this picture here, have someone underhand feed you balls so that you can start to identify and create your own reference points of what's number one, spacing, and what's number two, point of contact for you, right? And, and then once you identify these things, it's not like it's automatically now part of your game when you go out and start to play points and games and sets and matches. No, you're probably going to have to do this. I'm sorry for the next six months where you've got someone who starts off as I've got someone here, um, my good buddy, Ronnie. And Ronnie's over there just underhand feeding me balls from the alley, right? Obviously, don't want him in the middle, in the middle of the court. But then I had Ronnie go over to the other side of the net, just the other side of the net, and he would racket feed me balls, but still slow, slow. I don't want to have to work on timing, right? I don't have to work on, uh, on the actual timing of the incoming ball if he was feeding me balls from the baseline. So I get to continue to work on those two things. Number one, spatial distance away from the path of that ball. And what's my ideal, unique point of contact spot? And can I... Can I go ahead and allow the ball to get there, right? So underhand feed, then let them go. Then let your practice partner go to the other side of the net and just slowly racket feed your balls from, from, from the other side. And then maybe they back up a little bit, right? But you need to do this for the next six months, probably a couple of times a week. And just continue to work on those two things. If you got a ball machine, that's fine. Ball machine's fine, but again, I wouldn't have the ball machine at the other baseline firing forehands at you. I would have it just spitting them out so that you really get to focus on and create those two reference points for whatever shot you're working on. And then the fourth thing, and this is a bonus, right? This is just, this is just like icing on the cake. Once you've started to feel Here's my, here's my spatial distance that I want on this shot, right? Here's my contact point that I want to allow the ball to, uh, to get into, right? Well, and, and, and the icing is how smooth can you make this swing feel? You know, and I think way too often what we do is we go out there and practice, especially with underhand feeds, is we practice, let me see how big I can hit this shot. And that doesn't really, at, at that that kind of takes away from your, your being conscious of, of what are the, the two most important things, right? Which are going to be spacing and point of contact. And so don't try to see how big you can hit it. Try to see how smooth you can swing where you're still, you're still hitting on those number one and number two spacing and, and point of contact. And again, underscored with this is all unique to you right? You've got to tinker it. You got to fit, you got to figure them out. And it might take, might take you the first practice session where, where you kind of get some nice reference points on those two things. Great. But until you build the habits and we talk a lot about building habits, don't we? Um, and I just see Mark. Yeah. Mark says hitting off the wall is another way to work on this totally. But again, when you're hitting off the wall, don't, don't just crush it to the wall, right? Work on these two things because the ball is going to be just ripping back uh, at you off the wall. And you've got to be able to have some time, right, to be able to really focus on those two things. And I'm telling you, once, once you get into matches and you've spent enough time to where this has sort of been automated now, you're consistent with that spacing, right? You're not most of the time having to improvise because your spatial distance is too close or too far away. Now you got to tinker with a swing and do something goofy, but you've consistently got the right spacing. You've consistently got the right point of contact for you. And what you're going to find is what we've been talking about yesterday with the skill level range is the bottom is going to start moving its way up to the top. And, and once you get to that top and you're consistent with it, that's when you can start to take, you can take the whole package up you know, step by step, a little bit higher. So um, what do we got here? Rich, uh, sometimes I make a shot and I think the point is over and I become a spectator. Then I have to scramble when it comes back, missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's easy to do that, you know, and uh, I play with a guy on a somewhat regular basis who, who, who doesn't take advantage 
of hitting a really good shot to a corner gets me stretched out. And then somehow I just get a racket on it. And maybe it dinks back and it floats back. And the next thing you know, I look up and assuming that he'd be coming in, it would be an easy volley. And now he's starting to scramble from the baseline and doesn't get to it um, because just wanted to hit the big dinger and watch it and kind of, you know, bask in the glory. And the next thing you know is the glory is, is turned, you know, has kind of turned the, the corner there is not happening. So, yeah, I mean, when you hit a really great shot, whether it's an approach shot or whether it's a groundy and you get that opponent stretched out, you've got to assume that it's coming back. If it doesn't come back, all right, that's cool. But if it does come back as a floater and you're, and you're sitting there, you know, looking at the crowd going, you know, you know, how cool am I? Um, it's not going to be great. Uh, let's see, Joe. Joe is saying, if I'm uh, if I make a mistake on a point of contact, it will be I'm too early. <clears throat> of course, uh, I always ask you a better shot if I'm patient. Not always, I am patient enough. Yeah, so that's a big deal. I mean, you got to learn how to receive the ball. One of the things that Mr. Stowe worked on a lot was this was receiving balls rather than reaching out and kind of fighting it and trying to get rid of the ball. He actually wanted you to feel on your on your racket that the ball would kind of compress against the string bed rather than coming in and just trying to get off of the ball, get rid of it. He liked this feeling of, and he called it the conk, C-O-N-K, which was short for concussion. And there was a sound the ball made or the sound the ball makes when you allow the ball to get right into that string bed the way you want it, <clears throat> even if you're hitting spin, where the ball kind of compresses it, you know, I don't, lack of a better term, it just kind of flattens out um, because you're allowing the ball to kind of dwell on that. And again, I'm not talking about slowing the swing uh, speed down, but it's, it's, it's more that you're allowing the ball to get into your ideal point of contact. It's balance, it's posture, it's receiving the ball. It's not, it's not fighting it. Um, and then uh, Mark said, after talking about uh, hitting up the wall, got to have early prep to get the other things right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was talking to Erica Smith. I mentioned her the other day and we were talking about, um, we were just talking about not playing tight. And I was talking about her coach, uh, Jack Shaw, that she worked with for years before he passed away. And he talked about three things. <clears throat> number one was quick feet. Just always your feet are just number two was watch the ball. <clears throat> Excuse me. And number three is the quick feet and watching the ball enable you to have quick prep to, you know, be able to get turned, to be able to have quick racket prep. And look, the initial turn is not probably where the right spacing is going to end up. You're going to have to adjust. You're going to have to adjust with your feet to, to get the right spacing. A lot of players turn and if the ball's somewhat close to them, that's all they do. And the chances go way up that the ball is not going to be spatially where you want it. So there's always minute adjustments. Lots of times when you're on the run, um, when you're on the run, you've got to make minute adjustments in terms of spacing. You might be early prepped with a racket, but that doesn't, but that doesn't, you know, a, it's not guarantee that you've got the right spacing just because you've got early racket prep. Not saying you should have late racket prep. I'm just saying it's part of the deal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mike, thanks for checking in this morning. Uh, very good and practical brand. I always take away the one practical thing to implement into my game and I keep improving. Good. And that's, that's, you know, another thing I got from Mr. Stowe. I mean, he tried to keep everything so simple. That, that 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 he knew. I mean, the the three guys he, the four guys he had in the court, the three guys and then me, because they were all top five in NorCal. I was like top two hundred and eighty. Um, how I got in that group's another story. But he always, you know, he had four guys in the court who were just chomping at the bit to become better, and he knew that if he gave too much information that we would go away and try to work on everything he told us on that morning. And this was, this was once a week, Wednesday mornings. Oh, ironic. Here we go. Wednesday morning today. Um, but we had him from nine to noon. We had him for three hours and, and his job he knew 
was to only give us a couple of things and find a way to not make it so boring that there was just such repetition, but kind of find different ways to kind of explain to him. One of the, one of the great things I loved about Mr. Stowe is he, he knew right. He knew early on with me. And I, just because we talked about this, that I grew up playing baseball as a kid, not that much tennis, even though I was, you know, a life member at the Berkeley tennis club and did I played a little bit of tennis as a junior, but it was mostly baseball. But he would talk about certain things in terms of uh, uh, in baseball terms. And so we'd be working on one thing for that for that three hour session. But he would mix in different terms, different phrases, different words, different whatever. So it so it stayed interesting. And, and so, Mike, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the big problems that pros have is they try to shove too much information into a 60 minute lesson thinking, well, this person's paying me money. I got to give them value. So maybe the value is, is just load them up with information. And I used to do that. Once I started going, Mr. Stowe, I realized, "Mm, wait a minute, I'm just screwing up. I'm just confusing, just confusing my students. So, um, so that's good. Uh, Randy, great points. Hope many understand how key these points are crucial. Every tennis player should pay attention. Well, Mr. Beerman checks in the mail. Thank you. Um, all right, guys. Well, look, I uh, hope this resonates with you. Get out there and get someone to underhand feed you some balls. Go on the go on the wall uh, like, like Mark suggests, but don't hit the ball hard. Just work on those two things. Once you have the two things, right? The spacing and the point of contact, then you can start to smooth out the swing and maybe get a little bit more racket speed smoothly, right? Not, not just, not just muscling up. Um, And look, you got to find it. You got to find a practice partner who's willing to do what, what you want to do. I've got one, right? The big O will do whatever I want out there. Right. And vice versa. I will reciprocate. And if he asked me some morning, Hey, you know, could we spend 10 or 15 minutes, you know, and, and you feeding me balls in this one thing? You got it, man. You've got to find that practice partner that um, that is willing to do that. And I find a lot of times when when someone asks me, hey, would you would you feed me this, you know, this a series of balls? And, and, and I learn a lot just by just by looking at them and observing and and seeing the things they do well and go hmm, now, am I doing that well myself or number two, looking at them and going, you know, am I making that mistake that they're making? And so I don't necessarily like to coach so much when someone's working. I figure that they've, I mean, sometimes I'll ask them, okay, well, what are you working on? What do you want? And is there anything you want me to look at or anything to focus on? And they'll tell me, but I, I know they're coming out there with something in their mind. And so I'm not going to overcoach that. I might confirm, I might, I might just give them a little reminder of what they told me in their words, just so that they don't stray away from, from that focus, but you got to find yourself a good practice partner. Um, or you got to have a good wall or you can have a good ball machine. To me, the practice partner is the best deal. If you can incorporate all three of those, uh, arenas, that's fine. That's cool. Um, cause sometimes I think it's really good to get out there and work on your, on, on your stuff on your own without, without anyone around. Um, all right. So seven around seven is quickly morphed into um, under 24 minutes this morning at seven fifteen. guys. That's it for me today. Hope you took some notes. Any questions down in the comments area, let me know. You can direct message me over at Facebook and or shoot me an email, Brent at web Love. Absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, what's on your mind. Any little thing that you, are thinking about with your game, any little thing you're not quite figuring out that you, you know, want a suggestion to um, that I might be able to help you with, let me know. Guys, that's it for me today. As always, get out there. Help another human. Have a spectacular day, guys. I'll see you again next time.